Hello and welcome to video number seven in my series of videos which are a response to an open letter to Neil deGrasse Tyson regarding the flat earth by D. Murphy 25 in which he asks 12 simple questions regarding the shape and nature of our earth. In this video I'm going to deal with three questions, questions 8, 9 and 10. They aren't really about the shape of the Earth. One of them is about the Coriolis effect and the next two are about the ISS. If you could demonstrate that there was no Coriolis effect, you would just be providing evidence that the Earth doesn't rotate. It would have nothing to do with the shape of the Earth. If you could prove that the ISS was faked, then all you would have proved is that the ISS is faked. That's it. That would prove nothing about the shape of the Earth. If you want the Earth to be flat, you need the ISS to be faked. But proving that it's fake wouldn't prove anything about the shape of the Earth. And there's no evidence that it is fake. In fact, there's enormous amounts of evidence that it's real. Uh, so anyway, let's... Uh, Look at his first question. I don't want to talk too much about this because there's not much to say, but anyway. Question eight. Why is the Coriolis effect so selective? This is an explanation of the Coriolis. Right, anyway, he goes on to talk about the Coriolis effect. Um, if you're not sure what this is, it is an effect whereby if something is moving in a straight line, and it is observed by someone who is rotating, then the thing moving in a straight line will look like it's following a curved path to the person who is rotating. So if you fire a bullet on the earth, the bullet continues in a straight line, but because you're rotating with the earth, the bullet looks like it follows a slightly curved path. Uh, then he goes on to show An example here. The surface. And according to this explanation, paper aeroplanes act in the same way. So imagine you were standing in Texas and had a magic paper airplane that could travel hundreds of miles. If you threw your airplane directly northward, you might think it would land straight north, maybe somewhere in Nebraska. But Texas is actually spinning around Earth's axis faster than Nebraska is because it's closer to the equator. That means that the paper airplane is spinning faster as well. And when you throw it, that spinning momentum is conserved. So if you threw your paper airplane in a straight line toward the north, it would land somewhere to the right of Nebraska, maybe in Delaware. So from your point of view in Texas, the plane would have taken a curved path to the right. Okay, so I mean that's obviously a totally unrealistic example just to make the point. Um, now he goes on to talk about real airplanes. This is the case for bullets, artillery shells and paper airplanes. Then why is it not the same for real airplanes? Because a real airplane is not catapulted from an airport and flung across the country. A real airplane is propelled by its own engines through the whole journey. So it is a completely different situation. A bullet is fired and continues on a straight line under its initial momentum. It doesn't have little rockets on board or engines that keep it moving. An airplane is moving relative to the atmosphere and the atmosphere is rotating with the earth. So it's a completely false comparison. That's all you really have to say about it. It's just a totally false comparison. Now, the question as to whether the Coriolis effect has any effect on airplanes or not at all, um, there's contradictory information online about that. Some people say that 
they have slight compensations to make for it. Some people say it has no effect at all, but whether it does or not, it's a totally different situation from a bullet or a paper airplane being flung across the country. So therefore, this is just not even a proper question because it's comparing two completely different things. Airplane is... Why is it not the same for real airplanes? Airplanes do not aim north to go east. In fact, if aircraft no longer rotate with the Earth when they leave the surface, then east to west flights should take much longer than west to east flights. So he manages to go into probably the oldest, oldest flat earth cliche in the book about east to west flights. As I've explained on another video, this is like being in a train and sitting at one end of a carriage, flying a little toy helicopter up to the other end and back again. It will take the same amount of time going up the carriage as it does coming back down despite the fact that the whole train might be moving at 100 miles an hour. It's because the carriage and the air and the tables and everything in it are all in the same frame of reference. Two airports on Earth are going to be in the same frame of reference. The atmosphere is more or less in the same frame of reference as the airports. It's not completely because there are winds and such like, but it's more or less. And landing on a moving runway would seem to be quite tricky. Every landing should be like this. Well, again, this is just another dishonest comparison. And not, under normal conditions, the atmosphere and the runway are pretty much in the same frame of reference as each other. So the plane doesn't have trouble landing. In a high wind like this, the atmosphere is in a different frame of reference to the airport. It's moving relative to the airport. Therefore, the plane has trouble landing. And wouldn't there be planetary direction indicators by runways, just like there are wind direction indicators? So why is the Coriolis effect so selective? It's not. Question nine. What is the International Space Station flying over? Okay, once again, he just makes a totally dishonest comparison again. So he's comparing this to this. In this situation here, the things on the horizon look like they're moving much more slowly than the things that you can see close to the airplane. And the reason for that is because the things on the horizon are many times further away than what you can see close to the airplane. Now, in this situation, the ISS is a long way from the Earth. You see, here, the airplane is just above the Earth. The ISS is a long way away, so the horizon isn't many times further away than what you can see here. So again, it's just a totally fake comparison. I mean, all you have to do is get a ball and hold it up near your eyes and spin it. And you'll see that it just looks like this. And as I said, I mean, even if, even if this was a valid argument showing the ISS isn't real, so what? What would that have to do with the shape of the Earth? It would just mean that the ISS wasn't real. That's all it would mean. Right, um... So what's he saying next? The moment it appears on the horizon, it moves at the same speed until it disappears below the camera. And while we're on the subject of the ISS, question 10. How can microgravity be selective? Watch these people bobbing around in microgravity. Did you notice the problem? Watch it again. As we look back at the achievements of the past year, Did you see the water the drip in the background? Well, for a start, how do you know it's water? And 
there are so many of these videos that show things. Did you notice the problem? That, that show things floating about in the ISS. Now, considering it's a weightless environment, that's not that strange. Now, there are other videos that show things floating up the way that conspiracy theorists claim are bubbles and that the people are in a swimming pool. And when they see something moving down like this, they claim that it's water dripping from above. Now, it can't be both. It can't be bubbles in a swimming pool and water dripping from above. Um, there are multiple possible reasons why you could see something like this on a space station. Uh, let me just suggest a possible one. Right here on Space Answers, the question is asked, do they make oxygen to breathe on the ISS? And the answer given, and you can check other sources, they all give you the same answer. Electrolysis of water is the main method to generate oxygen on board the ISS. Water is split into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen is vented into the breathable carbon air system. Okay, The oxygen is vented. Another way of saying that is that it's blown in. So oxygen is being blown in or vented into the ISS. So that means there's going to be air currents within it. That means that things will be getting blown about in all directions. Especially since it's a weightless environment, once they start once they're blown by the air, they'll just keep moving. Now also, I don't know if this is possible, but let me suggest the possibility of it. It says here that the oxygen is made from the electrolysis of water. Is it so unbelievable that maybe some drops of water come in with the oxygen? Maybe that's not possible. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. Just suggesting it. But there could be lots of things. That, that could have been anything getting blown about in the air within the ISS. The idea that this is some kind of Proof that the ISS is faked is just absolutely ridiculous. We hope to accomplish in the year ahead. I want you to keep your eye on the ketchup bottle once it's placed on the table. Right here, you can see that there is nothing on the bottom of the bottle, no Velcro or magnets. It's just an ordinary bottle. And in a moment, you'll see the ketchup bottle being placed on the table. Now, keep your eye on it. See how it rocked when you nudged it? Okay, so this is an example of the unbelievable dishonesty of this guy. If you look at the actual footage of this in its proper resolution, and I have to give a shout out here to Mr. Unite for the Children because he was the one that noticed this. If you look at this properly, let me make it full screen. Now I'll include a link to this. You can see clearly there is something on the bottom of the bottle. You can see it there. I'll go through it again. Just make sure you can see that. Can you see it there? There is clearly something stuck on the bottom of the bottle. So his claim that there's nothing on the bottle is just a lie. Now, what could it be? Well, let's watch a little clip from this video here about useful items on the ISS. And it says here, Richard shows how Velcro magnets and a deck of cards are must-have space travel accessories. 
Well, it turns out that, uh, yes, these are actually tools uh, that I've been uh, playing with here already quite a bit here on the space station. It turns out Velcro you need all the time because Velcro you use to keep all of your other supplies from floating away. And uh, uh, for example, here with my pen, you'll notice a little blue spot of Velcro on the pen, and that's so that I can stick it to the wall and it won't uh, float away. Right. So he's telling you that he's put a little bit of Velcro, a little circle of Velcro on a pen so he can stick it to the board and it won't float away. Look familiar. Could that possibly be what's on the bottom of that bottle? It looks like the same thing to me. It looks like a little spot of Velcro. You can see it there and you can see it on this pen. Now, further to that, it mentions here uh, on Space Answers, what's usually for dinner on the International Space Station. Now, it says here, even though the ISS is constantly experiencing microgravity, there is a table that astronauts congregate around to eat their food. To eat, sorry. And their food has to be held down to the table using bungee cords and Velcro. Okay? It states here clearly that they use Velcro to hold their food down to the table. This guy here demonstrates putting a little circle of Velcro on a pen and you can see that there's a little circle of Velcro on that bottle. That's it. So just three questions that were just, again, dishonest and just complete nonsense. 